know I'm trying to keep the history of the Roman Empire compartmentalized so it's easier for us to understand. So in the first century, you know, there was the Julio-Claudio dynasty followed by the year of the four emperors followed by the Flavian dynasty. And that pretty much takes us to the end of the first century. The second century, basically, if you could just remember that it starts with the five good emperors. And the first one, which was appointed by the Senate after the death of Domitian, was Marcus Nerva, which starts in 96. But this basically tends to get our mindset to know that this starts the second century. Now, he only lasted for two years because he was advanced in age. Now, the first thing he did was stop the Senate trials and gave them power and respect back. He halted the expansion and he fixed the frontiers along the Danube and the Rhine. Now, also one of the first things he did within a year of his reign was appoint a successor, which was timely because Nerva died the following year. So he went from 96 to 98. And his pick for his succession broke the chain of the earlier dynasty's hereditary successions. Because he picked the best man for the job. Now, the first century had 12 emperors in all. So, not bad, because we're going to see how some centuries here have a lot, which means there's a lot of problems. Now, the next man that takes over is Marcus Trajanius, better known as Trajan. Now, he became emperor in 98. Now, under Trajan, imperial expansion was renewed, and he was one of Rome's greatest soldier emperors. He also was shrewd enough to elect an equally great successor, which secured the imperial succession. The empire was even more dependent now on defense and government by military force more than ever. Now, we have problems right away under his reign on the Danube and the Swabi tribes were becoming restive. They enlisted the aid of the Jazygist tribes in an invasion of Pannonia. Now, the Danube, remember I stated this a little bit before in the last video, that it now became the key frontier with nine legions stationed along its entire length. And as you will see, most generals or emperors will come from this area. Now, no major battles had developed with these two tribes early on. However, the major battles came again with the Dacians. Now, you remember the Dacians uh, made a treaty with Domitian. Now, this treaty was either rejected by Trajan or the Dacians broke it. We're not quite sure. Either way, Trajan conducted two campaigns against them. Now, the details of the warfare remain unknown, but we do know the first campaign, which was in 100-101, ended in, at least in a major battle. Now, one can summarize Trajan's justification for this war based on five factors. One, Dacian aggression against Rome. One, the unsatisfactory peace between Rome and Dacia. Uh, the dangerous flow of Roman deserters into Dacian. And the promise of plentiful booty, which Dacia had a lot of gold mines. In 101, he launched his first campaign. And there was a major battle at the Iron Gates of Transylvania, but it was not a decisive victory. And Trajan's troops took heavy losses, and he put off any further campaigning for the year in order to regroup and reinforce his army. And of course, the Romans called it a victory. Now, Decebalus also took time to regroup and enlarge his force, and then he launched a counterattack across the Danube frontier, supported by the Sarmatian cavalry. Now, this forced Trajan to come to the aid of the troops in his rear guard. The Dacians and their allies were repulsed after two battles in Boeotia. This was at Nicopolis and Istrum. Now, Trajan's army then advanced further into Dacian territory, but the strategy and tactics are lost. Trajan defeated Decebalus in a bitter battle, and Decebalus accepted peace terms. So we do give Trajan one victory for here, and the Roman battle record goes up to one victory. 
Now, Decibals had to renounce his claim to some of the regions and return runaways from Rome that were under his protection and surrender all his war machines. Trajan then returned to Rome in triumph, and he was granted the title Trajan Daxius. The peace of 102 had returned Decibalus to the condition of more or less a harmless client. However, he began to rearm and harbor Roman runaways again. Now, in the meantime, uh, Decibalus was making allies, planning resistance against the Romans. He even devised an attempt on Trajan's life by some Roman deserters, which failed. He also took prisoner one of Trajan's Legatius Mulginius, who eventually poisoned himself. Finally, in 105, he invaded Rome itself. Now, by 105, the concentration of Roman troops assembled in the middle and the lower Danube mounted to about 14 legions, about half of the entire Roman army. Now, including the auxiliaries, the number of Roman troops engaged on both campaigns was probably around 150,000 to 175,000, Why Decibalus could dispose of up to about 200,000 uh, troops, including allies. Now, other estimates gives the Romans about 86,000 active campaigning with the reserves and Decibalus around 50,000. Now, this was a fierce campaign to which seems to have been mostly static warfare. In 105, Trajan returned and pushed his way northward despite fierce resistance. By the time he reached the capital, which now this is hard to pronounce for me, uh, Sarmazagusta, the Romans had broken the army of Decibalus. The Dacian scorched earth policy, coupled with the vigorous Roman offensive, had depopulated the country. Decibalus committed suicide. Trajan declared Dacia to be a province of the Roman Empire. So Trajan gets another victory for this conquest of the capital. This brings us to 114 to 116 Parthian Wars again. Now in 114, the Parthians once again moved to put their own leader on the throne of Armenia, and they invaded Syria. The de facto boundary between Rome and Parthia was the Euphrates River. The only disputed territory was always Armenia, sitting like a buffer between Rome's northeastern frontier and the Parthian vassals Mesopotamia. Trajan decided to rectify the situation by annexing Armenia. In 114, he embarked on the invasion, and by 116, the Testophon fell without resistance. However, revolts and Parthian resurgence led to the abandonment of all territories east of the Euphrates River again. Now that ended in 116. And then, right after that, a revolt started on the northern Rhine. And while on his way back from the east, Trajan fell ill and died. Now some think he was poisoned. Now Trajan's extent of the Roman Empire was at its largest. He extended the empire, notably in Dacia, Arabia, Armenia, and Mesopotamia. He undertook a vast building program and, and enlarged social welfare. Trajan, he tried to secure competent and honest officials and he would send two out to each province. Now, one of the letters that maybe you could read on your own, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail, was by uh, Pliny the Younger, and he was, I believe, a lawyer, and the letters he would write Trajan was how to deal with Christians, because there was young, old, male, female, and by all reports, they obeyed the laws, and they didn't cause any problems aside from their religious beliefs, and so he wanted to know how he should be dealing with them? Should he torture them? Should he imprison them? Should he get them to confess uh, against their God? So these letters he wrote, Trajan was very interesting. And these letters are dated around 112 to 114 AD. So very close after the last apostle John had died, like in 90 AD. Because at this time, Rome did not adapt any type of laws or ways to deal with Christianity. 
they didn't realize the spread Christianity was having on the empire and throughout the social standings it was having. And these pictures we've been looking at here on the columns are his Trajan's column. So a lot of good carvings of his battles and successful campaigns on here. Now in 117, Publius Hadrianus, also known as Hadrian, took over, and in many ways he reversed the policies of his predecessor. But that is not to say that Trajan or Hadrian's methods were wrong. The times were changing. The steady migration of Asian people into Europe meant that pressure on Rome's frontiers had increased to an untold amount of tension. Now, Hadrian visited many outposts in his time and found it necessary for contraction and consolidation, and the areas marked as vulnerable were managed by fortification and entrenchments with signal posts and palisades. This ran from the upper reaches of the Rhine and the Danube, with limes built between the rivers. Now, limes are basically Roman forts, but they're basically adjoining areas together with you know, a loosely controlled, you know, military forces. And these camps were connected by road for easy support and communication. Now in Britain, the famous Hadrian Wall ran from the Tyne to the Solway. This wall was initiated in 122 AD when he visited the frontier. Hadrian's wall exemplifies the principles of Roman frontier defense. A well-defined communicating road, which again, Limes, ran along the frontier post, which troops could move along with efficiency and speed. Now, also during Hadrian's uh, emperorship, the infamous Ninth Legion disappearance happened. Now, just so, you know, there's been many movies and uh, talk about what happened to the Ninth Legion. Now, the last inscription we have of the Ninth Station was at York, its fortress base around 108. There is nothing noted of the Ninth listed anywhere else in the Empire after this. We know this because Marcus Aurelius listed the legions and their locations in 162 and two legions were not on the list. One was the 9th Hispania and the other was the 22nd. Now one constant action we could count on from soldiers in the army was leaving inscriptions of their units, their recognitions, their scribblings of the pride of their units, especially when building new fortifications. The highest concentration of building fortifications on the frontiers was between 108 and 162, and legions were famous for inscriptions and references to their legions on these fortifications. The two biggest concentrations of building walls were on the frontiers on the Rhine and Hadrian's Wall. There is a marking of the 9th Legion which was found in 1959 on the Rhine which dates about 125 AD. Now, this inscription was not the usual ninth markings inscriptions that were found in Britain where it was based. So the historians believe it was probably a vexillation, which means it was just a single cohort or maybe some century or just some soldiers that used to belong to the ninth. And they in turn made some ninth legion markings in this area. Now, truth be told, we really don't know what happened to the Ninth Legion, but there are, again, great movies and stories about it. Now, one of the first military actions in Hadrian's reign was, was in the Danube region. The Sarmatians continued to give trouble in this area. However, Hadrian negotiated a new peace treaty in 118, and this front lay dormant for the next 50 years. Now in 135, during the reign of Hadrian, Judea again revolted against Roman rule and institutions. The immediate cause was Hadrian rebuilding Jerusalem as a Greco-Roman city. The revolt was led by Bar Kokhba. The Jews began a systematic expulsion of all Roman forces from Judea. 
the tide turned when the veteran Roman general Sextius Julius Severus arrived to take charge of the legionaries. In a hard-fought campaign, he ruthlessly crushed the revolt by destroying 50 Jewish strongpoints and hundreds of villages. The Roman conquest was complete in 135 when Severus captured the seaport of Caesarea. Bar Kova was killed. Tens of thousands of Jewish combatants perished during the savage three-year struggle. The Romans do get a victory for this. Now Hadrian held the empire together and really enjoyed building projects. He loved Athens and built many buildings there. And this structure is Hadrian's Gate and it's sometimes known as the, the Gate of Olympia because it went from an ancient road from the center of Athens in Greece to the structures in the Olympian area. And this was the Temple of Zeus. It was the largest temple in Greece and it housed one of the largest cult statues. It had 104 of these colossal columns. And this building is Hadrian's Library and it was damaged in war a couple times and then refurbished and it was made into a church a few times. And this is part of the Roman Agora area, the marketplace. This is a picture of Hadrian's art. So pretty cool. Emperor Hadrian died at his villa at the age of 62. Antonio Pius becomes the new emperor in 138 AD. Now he basically presided over an empire of comparative peace. But the price was continue, vigilance, and preparedness on the frontiers. In Britain, Antonius tried to advance the frontier, as he tried also in Germany, and built another wall in form of a turf embankment on cobblestone, and it was based farther north. But 23 years later, it was decided to withdraw southwards and rely on Hadrian's Wall. Now, old problems had arisen. The situation generating now was that the military garrisons which manned the frontiers tended to be from settled communities in the area again because what was happening is even though they originally were recruiting soldiers and sending them to a far off area settlement, they started to settle down in their new areas and started to settle in the communities and they started to have relations with the women there and they became very local to that community. Now, this was a connection with the army to the people and the land. And as a result, habits and lack of mobility constituted a disadvantage for Rome. So legions were withdrawn from areas, say like Britain, where fortifications held the frontier and moved to other parts of the empire which allowed for incursions in the weakened sectors. So this is what is starting to take place. Pius had no military campaigns. Uh, it was said he didn't even go within 500 miles of a legion. He made very little changes and he built temples, theaters, and mausoleums, and he promoted the arts and sciences. This is the temple of Antonius and Faustina which was a, a marriage arranged by him and the Senate. He had to for annul another marriage that he was betrothed to. And this was all worked out behind the scenes with political, uh, same political dealings as other political arrangements. In 156, Pius turned 70 and he could hardly keep himself up and he ended up dying. And Marcus Aurelius becomes Emperor 161. He'll be the last of the so-called five good emperors. And you can see this is the Roman Empire. All their problems will be on the frontiers here in the east, here in the Danube, here on the Rhine, and here in Britain. Now, the frontiers are being weakened at this time. The soldiers are becoming complacent, remember, because they're settling whether they move the soldiers from an area to a whole different area eventually they become settling and they have families and 
Rome's enemies will take advantage of any vulnerability in Roman affairs. Now, one of the vulnerabilities that the enemies will take uh, advantage of is when an emperor died and a new emperor took over, the enemy would hope that the new emperor would be indecisive or unprepared to respond. And that's what's happening right here when Marcus Aurelius takes over. We have a Parthian war from 165 to 167, it only lasts a couple years, and this will be a Roman victory because in 165, uh, Parthia, which you know is Rome's oldest enemy now, provokes another war during Marcus Aurelius' reign. Now, under Vologius III, Parthian troops conquer Armenia, and then they threaten Syria. Aurelius sent Verus and Cassius and two armies into the east. Cassius marched into modern Iraq and captured and burned the Stesipon on the east bank of the Tigris. When Verus invaded Media, Vologius sued for peace and ceded Upper Mesopotamia. Now this was Rome's greatest victory in the east since Pompey the Great. Then, 166, the Danube Wars flare up again. And this is another Roman victory. It's the Battle of Aquileia. Now, three Germanic tribes, they cross the Alps into northern Italy. This is the Marcomanni, the Quade, and the Lazigius. They attacked Aquileia and were repulsed, but they did stay and laid siege to it. They also moved a force to Odorzo and ravaged and burned this town before moving up to the river. Now here, Marcus Aurelius hastily assembled the force of legionaries. The main army, remember, is still in the east because this is like 166 and the Parthian War ends at 167 and there's a plague that is scouring the area in the east right now. Now, Marcus managed to throw back the invaders, and the following year, he raised the siege of Aquileia. Now, this defensive victory was achieved largely because the barbarians lacked a single capable commander. When the enemy threat along the frontier persisted, Marcus Aurelius made peace. The original border was reestablished, but Marcus allowed barbarians to settle within the empire now. Marcus Aurelius recognized, as his predecessors did, that responsibility for imperial defense was more than a single emperor could handle. It was now common to call all emperors Caesars, and he appointed Lucius Verus to co-rule the empire. Now this was a poor judgment of character, because it was really Cassius who won the campaign for Verus. Now this is going to be proved to be deadly for Rome when Aurelius appoints his successor also. Now Aurelius, with all the wisdom and philosophy, he was known as a good philosopher, he appointed these people with the bad judgment call here. So we're not quite sure what to make of that. But one of the problems they're having now, like in the Danube and in Parthia, even though they're winning these victors and defeating them, it's hard to control these vast amounts of area the Romans just can't do it anymore and also like the Romans had meld horsemen and their own contingents of archers to retaliate against the Parthians horse and archers so they basically used the same troops uh, to their advantage against the Parthians now the why they're not able to bring Parthia into the Roman realm is because of the lack of troops to hold the territory and because of the vast desert area which would be hard to govern the lack of numbers was also told heavily on the Danube also. Now, unfortunately, the manpower problem became all the more critical when a plague from the Parthian campaign was brought back. Remember, I told you there was a plague there, and now that's sweeping into Rome. Now, Aurelius was forced to form a German militia. The price for this was land with which they settled for their service. In Dacius, Marcus and his officers secured the line back on the Danube. So remember, they had controlled all the way out in the Dacia up to the Mark, uh, up to the Sarmatians area, but now they settled back on the Danube. 
and the large frontier province of Dacia to the north of the river, which Trajan had previously annexed, was given to the German militia. This now allowed a right of way to be granted to the barbarian tribes, allowing them to preserve communications with their eastward counterparts. But also in some sense, this was a buffer between the westward expansions and the frontier. It also provided a semi-conductor of forces. Aurelius could have rendered territory beyond more secure, but he had other problems. Cassius in the east revolted because he heard a false report that Marcus was dead. Cassius was then murdered by one of his own centurions. Now the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180, the five good emperors takes almost up the entire second century. And remember, the first good emperor, which was Nerva, he died in 98. So really, there's only been four emperors here in the second century so far. But once again, Aurelius used poor judgment and he passed on his role to his son, Commodus. Commodus becomes Caesar in 180. His rule lasted for 12 years and he did not plan for any heir. He was a man of low character and weak morals and was eventually murdered as a result of a conspiracy hatched by his Praetorian Guard commander who had for some time shared real power with other favorites for the crown and at last decided the present emperor was no longer necessary. Now, Commodus, he did campaign with his father on the Danube and when his father had died, he quickly came to terms with the German tribes. And Cassius Dio, the contemporary of Commodus, an historian wrote that Commodus was not a naturally depraved human being. But you kind of go down that road when you're probably bored or you have nothing to do. And there was a plot against him, which was conspired with his sister, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator with your, where his sister conspired against him? That is true. And Commodus did retaliate by executing a number of leading senators. Thereafter, his rule became increasingly arbitrary and vicious. In 186, he had his chief minister executed in order to appease the army. Now, political influence slowly passed to the emperor's mistress and two advisors. Meanwhile, Commodus was lapsing into insanity and he believed himself to be Hercules and he loved to fight in the gladiatorial arena, which most leading Romans and senators found to be appalling for an emperor. But every match he won because no one was going to kill the emperor, but also Commodus did not kill his opponents in the arena either. He let them live. But in contrast, when he would practice for the arena, he would often kill his opponents in the practice. He once slew a hundred lions in one day. Uh, after so much of this, the senators and advisors planned to have him killed by a champion wrestler to be strangled in the arena, which he did, and Commodus died. At that point, a grateful senate proclaimed a new emperor, the city prefect, Publius Pertinax. Pertinex was a good choice. He had fought in the Parthian War, where his success led him to be promoted to higher ranking positions. He was a member of the Roman Senate, serving at the same time also as Cassius Dio, the historian. Now, following the death of Commodus, he attempted to institute several reform measures, although the short duration of his reign as emperor prevented the success of those attempts. One of those reforms, the restoration of discipline among the Praetorian Guard led to conflict that eventually culminated in Pertinex's assassination by the Guard. But Pertinex would be deified by the Emperor Septimus Severus. Now Pertinex reigned for one year. Then the Praetorian Guard auctioned off the Imperial throne to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder, after hours of bidding, was Julianus and he promised 20,000 sestatarines to every Praetorian guard. And this is about a quarter of a denarii. Now, the Senate, who is now being threatened by the army, also declared him emperor. So, 
Now, because he bought his position rather than acquiring it in the conventional means such as succession of Congress, he was deeply an unpopular emperor. When Julianus appeared in public, he frequently was greeted with groans and shouts of robber and parasite. Once, even a mob threw stones at him as he was trying to enter the gates. Now, when news of the public anger reached across the empire, there was three influential generals who proclaimed themselves as emperors. One was Niger in Syria, one was Sivarus in Pannonia, and the other was Albinus in Britain. And each of these was able to muster three legions, and they rebelled against the empire. And we'll continue that in our next video when we start the third century. Rome's battle record improves to 95 and 40. I have to give them a loss here, even though they didn't lose any big campaigns here in the second century. But I forgot to add one in the first century with the Judean revolt. So it's 95 wins, 40 losses, and four draws. And we will start the third century with our sixth Roman Civil War.